So, a lot of fitness YouTubers like to bash fat acceptance, and I'm no different. I'm not really a fitness YouTuber, I don't consider myself such, I might become one in a while, but I, I don't really consider myself a fitness YouTuber at this point in time. But uh, they like to bash the body positivity movement, and they like to bash fat acceptance, and they're very right to do so, okay? One of the interesting things that I think is overlooked, see, my main experience as a personal trainer was not actually as a personal trainer, it was as a nutritional coach and a healthy lifestyles coach at a not-for-profit outpatient mental health clinic. So essentially what happened in this situation was I was kind of arguing with morbidly obese therapists about the health of their clients that they put in my group because their clients wanted to lose weight. Now the thing is Mental health, now I want to point this out, for whatever reason, the DSM-4, or I'm sorry, the DSM-5, the new Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, has taken obesity out. Obesity has been removed from the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of, um, you know, for uh, diagnosing mental health issues. Now, obesity itself might not be a mental health issue, but compulsive eating most certainly is, and luckily that has not been taken out. Binge eating has not been taken out. But the thing is, a lot of people talk about the dangers of anorexia. Okay, I do not support anorexia. By, by anorexia, I mean anorexia nervosa. Anorexia is also a physiological state where the body releases a hormone called orexia, which makes one more alert and more, um, uh, more, what do you call it, uh, more alert and more amped, like the less hungry, more alert. And that's what happens when you don't eat for a, a time, you begin to develop this state of physiological anorexia, uh, which is different from the mental illness anorexia nervosa. Now, before I get deep into this, I wanna make sure people understand I am not a mental health practitioner. I am not a health care provider. I'm not a physician. I'm not a chiropractor. I'm not a nurse. I'm none of that. But I want to let people understand that the problem that I see in mental health is that this influx of liberalism has caused um, an exception and an acceptance of the body, body positivity movement and allowing people to be overweight and obese. Now, that's not good for the public, and it's not good for the clients of these therapists that are trying to help these people become mentally, uh, mentally well when they themselves are not mentally well, but in fact mentally ill. And how do I know that a, an obese person is mentally ill? Now, I want to make sure that people understand. I'm not diagnosing anyone. I'm just looking at what happens. Well, what is obesity the result of? Obesity is the result of compulsive eating. Okay? If you are compulsively overeating, eating more calories than your body can burn, okay, you have an issue with overeating. I don't care if it's just simple overeating. I don't care if it's binge eating. I don't care what you call it. The problem, the, the facts are the facts. You have a mental health disorder that is keeping you from maintaining a normal body mass index. Okay? That's the truth. Okay? So when somebody goes to a therapist, if a therapist is obese, if a therapist doesn't look put together, like we had a guy, a scraggly guy, he liked to, uh, he liked to, uh, what do you call it, uh, philosophize about, you know, uh, what's his face, uh, uh, oh my god, uh, Sigmund Freud and all the, uh, you know, the nonsense about psychoanalysis, he, you know, psychoanalysis, he thought he was a really smart dude, scraggly beard, uh, looked like crap, didn't look like he bathed on a regular basis, 
wore Birkenstocks all the time everywhere around the you know around the place we weren't supposed to have open-toed shoes I mean this was a therapist that worked a drug and alcohol therapist that looked like he was on drugs okay I'm not saying he was on drugs dude looked like he was on drugs though um, and I think when you go to a therapist essentially what needs to be considered is is the therapist put together do they look put together do they are they shaggy looking are they disheveled looking do they look like they haven't slept in a week do they look obese do they look far too thin okay these are things that people should take into question when they're going to a therapist or when they're uh, sending a loved one to a therapist in my opinion because in my opinion going to somebody that is clearly a compulsive overeater would be like going to a therapist that's a, um, a sex addict or um, a compulsive uh, gambler or an alcoholic if you have a problem with one of these issues. You're not going, if you're a drunk, going to an alcoholic therapist is not going to help you get well. And that's another thing, the, the amounts of compulsive gambling, uh, sex addiction, and uh, alcoholism and drug use amongst therapists is also quite high. And I know at least where I worked, it was quite high. Okay. And that was a common occurrence. Uh, therapists using drugs, therapists talking about cocktail night, therapists going for drinks after work, you know, and there's nothing wrong with having a drink or what have you once a day or something like that. I'm not a big believer. I don't even believe in the modern definition of alcoholism. I think I believe in the old time definition of alcoholism, that it requires a physical addiction to alcohol. But the fact of the matter is, if your alcohol use is interfering with your life, like many of these people's it was, then you have a problem. I might not consider it alcoholism, the DSM does, but the thing is, you have a problem with alcohol. And a lot of therapists have problems with alcohol. But yet that does not stop them from preaching to their clients about how to behave. And this is the problem is, there was one therapist that saw the therapist as an authority figure. That was her belief that the therapist must remain an authority figure the whole time. Uh, you can't be an authority figure when you're flawed and when you're grossly flawed. And this is one of the reasons this old fashioned form of therapy got tossed out the window decades ago is because, you know, it's better to come off as a human being that can uh, talk to people on their level that a flawed per everybody's flawed but the fact of the matter is when you're so flawed that you have overt mental illnesses such as compulsive overeating or binge eating or uh inability to manage your weight properly or inability to manage your sobriety properly chances are you're not mentally well enough to be a therapist and it seems to me to be all too common and it's not just where I worked. I know people that were drug and alcohol counselors at other places that were drunks and drug addicts. They were recovered, allegedly, but then they went back to it. And like I said, you know, everybody has flaws. And that's one of the biggest problems, I think, with, um, with the uh, therapeutic uh, business here, the mental, health the mental health industry, is there's such, th there's such a fake, fake, fake outlook that people that work in mental health are perfect. They're not. And the people that go to these people for therapy need to understand that the people that they're seeing for therapy are flawed and some of them are far more flawed than they are. One of the things that liberated my mind uh, from this, and I do, I have to thank my, uh, my outpatient psychiatrist when I was a child Ironically, he worked at the same place that I worked at. Um, he, he passed away long before I worked there. But like he pointed out to me, he goes, what you're not understanding, because I had, a, I had a lot of diagnoses that didn't match me. They didn't match my mental health uh, symptoms. And he told me, he goes, the problem that you have is that you're under the assumption that the psychiatrists and psychologists that are diagnosing you are sane. 
And the truth is, and this is from a psychiatrist, this is a world-renowned psychiatrist, was my psychiatrist, uh, he said, you know, psychiatry has some of the craziest people in it. And that I shouldn't take to heart what they're saying about me. Okay? Now, this gentleman was uh, Turkish. And he thought it was highly ridiculous because I was diagnosed with xenophobia, which is a fear of foreigners. And he thought it was ridiculous because obviously I did not have a fear of foreigners. He was my psychiatrist since I was younger. And I was in my early 20s, maybe, at the time. I think I was. I think I was 20 at the time, which is when I stopped treatment. Um, and he, he told me, you know, th this diagnosis doesn't match, and it's because this person who was a Nigerian or a Liberian or whatever, he gave me this diagnosis out of spite. It was a spite diagnosis. And then my psychiatrist explained that a lot of my diagnoses that didn't seem to match my symptoms were spite diagnoses and that psychiatrists if they don't like people they will give them a spite diagnosis because that diagnosis will follow them and that diagnosis will make everybody look at them a certain way uh, another diagnosis that's popular is borderline personality disorder that's a uh, another one that's very popular that people give people out of spite um, and it's it's very sad Another, uh, and, and it's, um, it, it's very interesting when you see how flawed, working in mental health showed me how flawed the mental health industry is. Uh, there was one, now I learned, I learned a lot more about autism now, uh, because of my interest in a girl with autism, I, I made sure I learned about autism. I had a female client that had Asperger's syndrome when I worked in mental health. And this is not even an exaggeration. Her therapist told her. Now, I don't, I don't know if this is what the therapist said, but I have no reason to doubt the girl. My friend, or not my friend, I should say, my client, sorry, my client, who will remain nameless, but she was a young woman that had Asperger. She was about 20, 23 years old. She was diagnosed with Asperger's uh, in hospital, in a mental health clinic. And when she got out, uh, it was a newer diagnosis. She had other diagnoses like social anxiety disorder, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, schizoaffective disorder, uh, basically just a bipolar disorder, clinical depressive disorder. Uh, it, it's weird because you have to rule out other diagnoses. Uh, and none of these were ruled out. She just had a, a slew of diagnoses. So she was asking her therapist, what is Asperger's? Because she doesn't know what it is. And the therapist, from what this girl told me, the therapist told her flat out, and I'm quoting the girl, the therapist told her that Asperger's is when you're really, really smart, but also mentally retarded. Okay? Now... If you're a therapist, you should know about the DSM classifications of things. The diagnosis of somebody as really, really smart and mentally retarded flies in the face of the DSM. Why do I say that? Because in order to be diagnosed with mental retardation, one has to have an IQ below 70. You can be mildly uh, what they call mildly retarded at 70. Anything above 70, according to the US DSM, you're not retarded. And this girl's IQ, if I remember correctly, was like 125. So she was gifted, okay, she would fall into the classification of giftedness, and her therapist is saying, oh, that's when you're like mentally retarded, but really, really, really smart. The sad thing is with this girl is she trusted her therapist. She believed her therapist was looking out for her. She believed her therapist knew what her therapist was talking about. And I'm like, look, she don't know what she's talking about. That's not a legitimate explanation of what Asperger's is. 
Unfortunately, at the time, I really didn't know what Asperger's was. I told her it was high-functioning autism. I knew a little tiny bit about autism at the time because autism, honestly, what's funny is autism, even though it's a thing in mental health, it doesn't really take the forefront. A lot of what takes the forefront in, um, in mental health clinical treatment and especially what I did, which is support. I was a support, I was support staff. I was like a case manager. What takes the forefront is the other things that go along with autism, like the social anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, anger outbursts, things like that. That's, that's what gets this, the, the, that's what the symptoms are what get looked at, not the actual neurological condition. Okay. So this chick, this chick was also accused, she was overweight and somebody accused her of being anorexic because she, she wasn't eating enough because she was clinically depressed. She didn't have an appetite because she was clinically depressed. So lo and behold, another therapist suggested to her that she had anorexia nervosa. And I explained to her, I'm like, I'm not going to use her name. I almost did by mistake. I'm like, look, look, you don't have anorexia nervosa. And she goes, how do you know I don't have anorexia nervosa? So-and-so said I have anorexia nervosa because I'm not eating. I go, well, you're not, not, you're not, not eating for cosmetic reasons. You're not, not eating because of body dysmorphic disorder or because you think you're fat or anything like that. That's number one. The reason you're not eating is because you have a loss of interest in life. Boom. There. That's clinical depression or a depressive episode in bipolar disorder. That's easy to understand. So it's clearly not anorexia nervosa. To make it even more not anorexia nervosa is the girl had a BMI of like 30 which I believe borders on obese. And I tried explaining to her, I'm like, You're, it's impossible to have an, a, a diagnosis of anorexia nervosa and to be overweight. And I, I tried to explain to her, I'm like, look, you need to get rid of this therapist. But she liked the therapist. The therapist was treating her fine. And I, I just, I kept saying, you know, this chick, the, not, the, not the girl, not the client of mine, but this therapist kept insisting these wild things to this girl, and she kept taking them in and taking them in and taking them in. And then they wonder why people have such bad uh, self-image problems, self-esteem problems, etc. Well, how would you feel if you're going to somebody to get mental health care, and they tell you you're anorexic when you're overweight. They tell you, uh, they, then they tell you, they go about telling you that uh, <laughs> you're, you're mentally retarded, but really, really, really smart. You don't think that drags somebody down a, a notch or two? Okay, I don't think that a lot of these mental health practitioners, these therapists, these counselors, they don't know what the hell they're doing, and it's harming the public. But one of the biggest harms to the public is overweight and obesity in this country, and metabolic syndrome, okay? And what's the cause of this? The cause of these issues comes from bad eating habits and body positivity being pushed on kids from school age and up, and it's true. Look, I was a fat kid in school. It's not fun getting bullied. It's not. Okay? It does hurt when you get bullied. Whether you know it or not at the time, it does last. It has a lasting effect. I got bullied for being fat. Didn't really affect me at the time, but yeah, I was bullied for being fat. It doesn't feel good. However, the reverse which is everybody should be comfortable with blah, 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 and love their bodies the way their bodies are. No. No. You should not love your body the way it is if it's the way it is because you are not taking care of it. As Greg Doucette says, you should love your body, you should love it enough to eat right and exercise. And that's the truth. 
when you're not doing that, you wouldn't tell people, oh, alcoholism isn't a big deal. Just drink all the beer and wine and, and hard liquor you want. It's not a big deal. As long as you're comfortable with your alcoholism, it doesn't matter. Or, oh, yeah, keep using heroin. As long as you're comfortable with yourself the way you are, keep using heroin. It doesn't matter. That's your body, your choice. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't be telling somebody using cocaine, oh, yeah, just all things in moderation, just a little bit of cocaine and ain't going to hurt you. Okay, this is not healthy advice. And this is not advice that would be given under any other circumstance. Okay, except maybe gambling. I've, I've seen ridiculousness with dealing with compulsive gambling in a therapeutic, uh, a therapeutic thing where, oh, well, if you only gamble two times a week, that's okay. Uh, it, no, it's not. It's not okay. It's not something to beat yourself up over. I, I've never had a gambling issue, though. I've known people with gambling issues, very bad gambling issues. And it's not something that is, um, it's not a good addiction to have. It's very unhealthy. Uh, and it's, it's, it doesn't work out in the long run for the person with the gambling addiction. But what I did notice in mental health is a lot of people, they substitute addictions for other addictions. Uh, a lot of former alcoholics and former drug addicts become gambling addicts, become pornography addicts, become sex addicts, become love addicts. There's actually a, um, a what is it, um, oh, uh, codependency is a big thing amongst uh, people with addictions. And my point is, is that if you go to a therapist, or a psychiatrist, and they look off, use your best judgment. And if you're somebody that's dealing with and caring for somebody that's severely not mentally well, and they you can't trust them to make their own decisions because they're that uh, not mentally well, do them a favor and try to make a judgment call on their behalf if that's what your job is, if you're, if you're a caretaker of somebody with a severe mental illness, if somebody is psychotic, or if somebody's mentally challenged, and you're taking them to a therapist, and the therapist does not look like they're all there, make a judgment call in the best interest of that person. It's your responsibility if you're their caretaker anyway, but you're not, you're not doing anything wrong by making sure that this person gets the best help that they can get. And that's all for this video.